Since we started with the uh, five precepts, maybe we can start with that one and then this one, recitation, and then kind of go down the list. So I think yesterday, uh, Jing Husher talked a lot about the five precepts. So I, I, are people familiar with the five precepts as a kind of general guideline for practice? Five precepts, yeah? Anyone not familiar with it? The five, not killing, not stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, and no intoxicants. Those are the, usually see as the uh, pancha sila, the five training rules, uh, the five ways of, of basic, you could say basic human conduct. In Buddhism, by holding the five precepts, you are able to maintain your, you could say, your human life. If you kind of go off of the five precepts, then uh, you easily enter other realms of existence. Um, like this morning, we talked a little bit about drugs. If you look at uh, the people who actually end up taking some of those things, like they take meth, and you just like type in the internet, meth users, the images that come up are actually, I was looking like it, it looks like, like a hungry ghost realm. You know, people who are really shriveled and there's this kind of uh, insatiable greed that kind of can't ever get filled and you just keep trying to consume. So the precepts actually are keeping us in a form that you could say allows us to, um, to grow spiritually. Um, that's a major piece of it. Um, if people are familiar with Buddhism, the Buddha didn't actually say his religion is called Buddhism. The Buddhism, there was no Buddhism in the Buddha's time. He called it the Dhamma Vinaya. Have people heard of that before? He says it's what he's leaving behind for his disciples called the Dhamma and the Vinaya. Dhamma or Dharma is Fa. And Vinaya is Lu. Jie Lu de Lu. Vinaya. The Dhamma Vinaya. And so usually, especially here in America, we've mostly emphasized this. People like the teachings, the teachings about the mind, the teachings about liberation, the teachings about ending suffering. Uh, this, as I understand it, because I wasn't there during the time, in the 60s and 70s especially, wasn't that popular. You know, people were actually really into drugs. You know, like the Rebung Shur said, uh, drugs, sex, and rock and roll, right? They were kind of going, not really living a life that's in accordance with the Vinaya. And so they went for the Dharma and meditation but they, did, they didn't really go for the vinya. And the problem with that is the vinya is actually, you could say, the optimal, em, optimal environment for you to practice within, to become liberated. Without that as a foundation, any work we do in practice doesn't really get us anywhere. They say it's like uh, cooking sand hoping to get rice, as the Shrangama Sutra says. It says it's like um, uh, put, trying to perfume excrement hoping that it will become incense. <laughs> you know, trying to like make excrement into very nice little sticks and then hoping that'll be incense. It just doesn't work. However hard you work, it's just not going to work. So essentially, this, these precepts are extremely important for basic s spiritual practice. And some people say, well, you know, Buddhism is kind of very negative because it keeps you from doing all these things. But I think what Jing Husher just described is when you actually really look at it, it's what you really do hope for the people that you care about. I remember um, being on the plane once. We were actually on a delegation, I think in Asia. We we're flying to Malaysia, actually. It was interesting, one of the, so one of the lay people, I think it might have been Mai in the Berkeley Monastery, we we're flying over and she says, oh, there's a person interested in Buddhism, you can answer her questions. So I sat down with her and I started talking to her. She was asking questions about it. Then she heard about the five precepts. Oh, isn't the five precepts it makes you really boring? You can't do anything. So, well, I don't know, because if you, if you were actually in a relationship with somebody, you probably would want them not to kill, not to steal, you know, not to cheat on you, not to lie to you, right, and not to get intoxicated and do stupid stuff. I probably you would want that, right? She's like, yeah, huh. You know, it's like when you actually start thinking about it, it's just kind of basics of how to be in relationship. And it's interesting is there's many ways to relate to other people that uh, come alive when you just have the five precepts as a foundation. Like just being here today in the Buddha Roof Farm with everyone together. There's many ways we connect with one another. And because we have the five precepts, which is almost not seen, it's a kind of a hidden thing that's here because we don't really watch. We're not really, um, you could say, um, tempted by these things in a large extent. But it's actually holding the space whereby we can all be together. And for the monastics, we take even more precepts which is kind of, you could say in the Buddhist tradition, 
what um, what it's not really like levels of hierarchy you could say but levels of commitment to the Dharma practice so for instance and that's why we actually respect say the monastics like we're, we're not like perfect by any means for sure we're ordinary human beings it's not like you take on robes and become wise you know, <laughs> Jing Rocher can attest to it, you know, and the, we're just watching, looking at the Sixth Patriarch Sutra and you have all these monks and, you know, these monasteries doing things that probably wouldn't be very good, right? But the idea is that we're, we're trying to keep the Buddhist tradition alive by maintaining the, the Buddhist uh, guidelines for how to cultivate in this world in the optimal way. So in society, there's lots of rules that are often designed for success or for, um, order in society in, or in a family. Sometimes you have rules in the family to maintain some kind of discipline, sometimes not. And often with a family with no rules, it gets pretty chaotic, right? But for the monastic order, there's actually really set structures of relationships that allow one to grow. So for, I'm gonna give you an example and then I'll go back. Like for instance, one example is a willingness to be corrected. That's like a very important part of the monastic code is because that's how you grow. If, like, if we have a fault, oftentimes we don't see it ourselves. So if somebody else is willing to point it out, think, okay, so I can work on that. You know, there's, a, there's a process of mutual support within the Sangha in the appropriate way. They say to do it at an appropriate time. First, you check, do I have that fault myself? Right? That's number one. They say, is it the right time? Am I only asking or, or telling the person out of kindness and compassion? You know, there's no anger behind it. My test for that is if they completely get angry at me, do I get upset at all? Because mm. if I get upset at all, that means I have some attachment to my own way of wanting something, mm. not just purely for their well-being. You know, there's a kind of like, I'm just doing this purely to help them out. And then, um, what else was there? Do you remember? There's right time, love and kindness. Uh, uh, let's see if it was a love and kindness. Um, if it's truthful, yeah, if it's truthful, it has to be factual. It has to be beneficial, meaning it leads to their liberation. You're not saying things that are going to get them in trouble. Um, and I think the last one, let's see if I remember the last one. The last one is if it's... Um, oh, speaking gently. <laughs> so you don't, you don't speak harshly to the person. You speak in a kind way. So, this, I mean, this is, if you even think of, a, of somebody correcting a friend, this is something that's very... Oh, and you also ask for permission. Mm. So you don't just kind of go off and do it yourself. You actually say, is it okay if I, 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 I mention something? You know, and then they, they say, yes, is a good time, then yes, I'm going to share. So what I mean is the precepts are actually not just some kind of rules out of nowhere. They're actually within this whole set of discipline and training that the Buddha gives us to practice within. It's like we were just playing soccer a moment ago with some of the community and we had two goals. You know, people were generally not using their hands except the goalies, right? And if we didn't have those basic rules and people were like out there slugging each other, you know, when they didn't get the ball, it would be pretty chaotic. And so the rules basically allows you to play the game of Buddhism. The game of Buddhism. Yeah, <laughs> the game of practice. Yeah, it's, and it's a training. It's, you're not, so you're not going to hold the precepts perfectly in the beginning because it's something we have to grow in and work in. Um, so the tricky part about it is, I think, in society, you're playing by a different set of rules. You're, we're playing, society has a very different set of rules. Usually, and maybe you can think about whatever communities you're part of, I think that society is actually usually, um, is usually structured around the five desires. I don't know if people know that list, the five desires. I can erase some of this here. This is actually a very helpful list, the five desires, because it gives you a sense of how things work. Do people know what the five desires are? Ooh, yeah. Three, six, Not, wealth, but, six. Yeah, wealth. Wealth. Uh, it's what you're greedy for. Uh, got it, got it. Wealth. Fame. Food. Yeah. Fame. Fame. Sleep. Sleep. Sex. Sex. Yeah. Oh, beauty is close in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty close. So, these are called the five desires. Wealth, fame, food, sleep, and sex. Mm -hmm. In whatever order you want. And, and the, the general, what happens is, 
each of us, and I think in any society, society is often built around these desires. I mean, I think society right now is largely built around wealth. Wealth, money right now seems to be extremely powerful as probably one of the most intimate things of people's lives. Because they're like, so, uh, so in our, like American society, I think wealth is really strong. In other societies, you know, like maybe Italy or something, I don't know what other countries, like food might be stronger, you know? Food's strong in America. Food's pretty strong. I don't know. Food, I, yeah, food's pretty good. So you can see here, each of these are something that we get really caught up in. And society is kind of designed to allow people to get these desires and to structure society through it. Um, it's interesting. So for me, if it's interesting. I just watch, you look at a community and you see how they work around it. Usually these five desires are essentially coming and going in different ways within. And then people try to make peace with one another in a way that allows these desires to kind of work, work themselves out in a way that people don't kill each other. You know? And so in society, it's usually built around desire. And that's the world we live in is called the desire realm. So when we're holding the precepts, we're actually trying to, um, you could say, work against, not I say against, but uh, through a different system of, of, of life. We're not trying to get trapped in desire. The reason, because the Buddha actually said, I don't know if people know the Four Noble Truths. You've heard of that, the Four Noble Truths. Dharma Master mentioned it today. It's, um, people know, what's the first, what's the first one? Is it there's suffering? There's suffering, yes, there's suffering. They're suffering, right? The first noble truth, they're suffering. Yeah, Kuji Min Dao. Suffering, pain. Do people know what the Buddha said about what you do with suffering? And when they're suffering, what do you do about suffering? <laughs> Taking pain pills, yeah. That's exactly what America does. But what does the Buddha recommend? To see it. To see it? Observe. Observe it, yeah. Observe, see it. He says to understand it. So it's not to take pain pills or run away from. It's actually to look at when the suffering occurs, you don't run away from. You actually go, can I understand this? What's going on? So there's an actual attempt to see what suffering, what suffering is all about, what this pain is all about. Actually, that's not a small thing when um, Joanne mentioned today about how America deals out pills very easily to avoid pain, yes. is that what that does is that actually shuts down part of our lives. The, the kind of part of our lives that is kind of a little bit uncomfortable, we, we push away and then we just want one part of our life, which is the comfortable, happy part. But that's not a very balanced view of the world. So we want to actually be able to hold both with a heart of equanimity. And that actually develops wisdom. If we just go for one extreme, what happens, I, I think you know, start noticing is that you can't just hold on to the state of comfort and happiness. It's impossible for long. So what happens is, there's a cycle that develops where you get uh, trapped in, um, in wanting a kind of a state that's not able to be maintained for a long term. And that's what the Buddha's second noble truth, which is the noble truth of where suffering comes from. And that comes from desire or craving. And so the second one where craving comes from is from these, among many other things. But these things, because we don't get these things, or even when we get them, we're scared of losing them, we have pain and suffering. So that's the second noble truth. And the third one is that the suffering can end. And the fourth one is the way out of suffering. And the five precepts is contained as one of the pieces of getting out of suffering. Um, the reason I'm kind of giving the larger context is because I think if you want to be able to explain this to somebody else, or even to explain it to yourself, you want to have a deeper ground to come from because you don't want to just say, I don't do it because I just don't do it. You know, that's not, my experience is that's not a very um, uh, strong place to be in because you're, you're kind of just following a little bit blindly. You don't actually really understand it. And what's even better than just understand is that you just actually see it for yourself. You actually see, wow, you know, when I break the precepts, I can see how much suffering it will cause for myself and other people. There's no, that you actually lose interest in breaking the precept, not because you're forcing yourself, because I actually really want to say, eat meat, is because I'm just not interested. I just know how much suffering is, is in the world from you know, animals dying, um, how unhealthy it is, you know, all the possible things that, that make this world, you could say, um, a lot of suffering come from breaking the five precepts. So I think that's a basic, maybe starting point. Um, 
if we're talking about specifics about explaining to friends and family and coworkers about the precepts, I think that's really requires each of our own wisdom. Um, my experience is you, it depends on how serious the person is actually interested in learning from you or listening to you. If you do have some time with like your good friend, then my experience is that they often usually are willing to listen. If you sit down with them, say, can I, can I actually share with you some of my commitments in life and why I'm, why I'm doing this, just so you can understand each other better, you know? And if they're a good friend, they go, yeah, I want to, I want to know what you're doing, right? Because you're good friends. If the person is just there to kind of challenge you and make fun of you, then we listen today in the, what the song of Awakening, right? People can slander, they can criticize. It's like lighting a flame, burning the sky, and then you're just burning your own hand. We don't have to worry about other people's um, criticism or slander. If, that's, if the, what they're saying is not out of principle, they're just, you know, there's, I think the other piece that you'll find is that people can also feel kind of threatened in their own habits when you're doing something different than them. And, and so you don't want to get righteous about it. That's even worse. That's, that makes it a lot worse. And I have to say, we're really much part of that. In my I don't kill, you kill. Yeah, it's a, there's a righteousness. So that's why I say we hold the precepts for ourselves. They give this little image one time somebody showed me. You know, we want to be round outside and square inside. <laughs> Meaning we hold the, the precepts for ourselves. We don't hold the precepts for other people. Look, you did that, you did this, you did this. You're not. It's like, okay, I'm keeping this discipline, but for other people around me, I'm uh, accepting. Uh, maybe for parents with kids, you need to do a little bit more teaching, but for many people, they're not expecting you to judge them or, or teach them in that way. At some point, if they see that you live a really good life and you don't have to seem to have that much suffering or problems, they might ask you, why are you generally happy? You know, why do things generally work out for you? And you can share, well, because, you know, I try my best not to lie to people and be honest whenever I can. So, you know, yeah, even when I know I'm going to take a loss, you know, when I know that I'm going to get in trouble for it, I, I made a mistake and I just try to take responsibility, although sometimes it's hard. And that's, and that's, that's I mean, that's actually a real commitment. If people have tried to do that, is that even when we do something wrong, it's an easy lie to get out. You go, okay, actually, I stick with the truth. Right? So that's, I think that's, I don't know if you have specific questions about that, about going out into the world. I think vegetarianism, if, especially if you're in California, is not too bad. People usually respect that. There's a literally good line for that. It says, Buddhism is not about, freedom is not freedom to act on desire. It's freedom from desire. <laughs> I mean, it's not to get, do whatever you want, which is usually what we think freedom is, is to do whatever I want, is that you're not enslaved to your wants. You know, we're not just pushed along by our greed, our hatred, our delusion. It's like we actually get freed from those. Can you say that again? Um, it's not freedom of, of to act on your desire, but it's freedom from desire. Mm -hmm. You're not enslaved to your desire. Um, maybe moving down to mindful consumption about using f food, media. Well, I think media is probably like the main thing in modern times for us because uh, it's so pervasive and it so easily goes down the wrong path and gets uh, either addictive or just simply distracting and takes up all our energy. So being at Buddha Roof Farm, I think you get a week without so much of it, but you probably feel a little bit different just because of just that, right? Um, I know about mindful consumption. Uh, I could say at least something about consumption that really, sh really, you could say, shocked me. Reverend Hung Shur showed us a movie called Century of the Self. How many people have seen that movie? People have heard of the movie? How many people have heard of that movie, Century of the Self? One, two, three, maybe because you listened to me mention it. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it's, uh, Reverend Hung Shur showed this movie and it's dated by a guy named, I forgot, I think it's Adam. And he won the BBC, I think, Documentary Award. And he basically documented how in this modern times, the era of marketing, public relations, consumers, consumerism arose. And it essentially started with was one person specifically. It was um, in America, we had, I think it was World War, World War II. And World War II was finishing. 
and the America was actually doing really well economically. And what happened was um, this, the companies and these industries wanted to keep the econo economy going. So they went to the person who did PR for America during World War II named Edward Bernays, who was actually Freud's nephew. Freud. Freud's nephew, Freud, Freud's nephew in, in Europe. And, uh, and he clearly, was, World War II was very, did a really good job because America was you know, fully behind the war. And so he told these, uh, these companies, there's no problem. I'll create for you the modern consumer and they'll buy your stuff and they'll never stop. <laughs> and and then, then the film goes on to document what he does and it's just shocking at how much that we right now take for granted about what it means to be a consumer and what we, what we use was actually created by him by manipulating the psyches of, of people. Like it showed uh, people before people try to advertise shoes, they would say, oh, cobblers say these shoes are really durable and we can fix it, you know, they last a lifetime. He says, no, 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 you gotta, gotta attach it to people's identity. So he gets these psychologists and these people's professors up on the screen saying, you know, your clothing has to express who you are for a healthy self-identity, <laughs> you know? And it creates this whole way of seeing clothing, you know, of course there's parts of that in the past, but he really brings it to the fore forward. Um, the other one that really struck me was cigarettes. At one point in society, females actually didn't smoke at all. And so the cigarette company went to this person, Edward Bernays, and said, there's a problem because half the population doesn't smoke. What do we do? He says, no problem. Okay, I'll, 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 have some, I'll do something about it. So he gets the young sufferettes, the, the, the young girls fighting for the women's vote, yeah. these uh, attractive kind of young ladies. Uh, they're marching for the vote in New York. He says, okay, I, I, each of you, you put a cigarette in your pantyhose, and when I give you the signal, you pull them out, light them up, and say, torches of freedom. <laughs> And then he tells all the newspaper camera people and his relations and says, there's something going to happen. Everyone come. So then he gives the signal. They pull out the cigarette up in the air, lit torches of freedom. You know, there's definitely things like Statue of Liberty. You can see freedom. And all of a sudden, overnight, the, there was no longer a stigma against women smoking. I mean, there's so much stuff that he created that when you start looking at the list of things that he created its modern society, it's, it's pretty stunning. But essentially, he created the modern consumer. So even the idea of consumption, like how we think about it, is like, you know, it, it was pretty much created in his last, you know, 60, 70 years. So I'm just pointing out to the word consumption. So we, I think we want to be careful uh, getting into a framework where we identify ourselves as consumers. Uh, because, uh, and I want to say, I don't think that really, that way of framing our lives leads to liberation. Uh, I think it leads to a kind of, we're still kind of trapped within a actual constructed way of being that society is, it's very powerful in society right now. And it kind of traps us in lots of ways. But um, when it comes to being mindful, at least we, we could be mindful as we're using things in the world so we don't get, uh, too trapped by them. Um, I mean, I think there's probably each of us know where our own addictions are. You know, when we when things get tough, what do we turn to? And do we turn to our phone? Do we turn to, you know, what is it? We go for food. You know, there's different things that we use to make ourselves feel better. And many reasons why the monastic form is what it is is that we don't have those outlets. You know, we don't have the outlets of the movies and the video games and the all the different things. We don't have we don't have food. We just eat one time a day. Right? So that's, in many sense, the reason for us as monastics to have less items to go for is that what it does is that we, it faith forces us to face our afflictions and suffering more directly. And we can't run from them, so then we have to face them. And the discomfort of that allows us to grow, grow as people. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, facing difficulty is actually a really wholesome energy. So I don't know if that helps in your, your question, but yeah. So like, for instance, if um, you were to experience some of the things that would cause someone to go to like their Instagram or something yeah. like that, mm -hmm. would you all like meditate? Like, you know, what would be or like go to your fellow Sangha Sangha, member? Yeah. Like what is usually uh, different methods? So, OK, so you mentioned a lot of these different practices. So these are actually what I think what's what's cool about Buddhism. You get lots of different tools for dealing with your affliction. So depending on the, the affliction. So for instance, like anger. 
Okay, anger, I don't go for meditation because if I just try to sit there with my anger, it doesn't work. I just get more tense. <laughs> so I found bowing works a lot better for any real strong affliction. Bowing. Bowing, like if, if I feel really anxi a lot of anxiety or f frustration or worry or anger, you know, you can do whatever you, however you do your bowing practice, but you might go in front of Gwana Bodhisattva and I bow. And I bow slowly with my breathing. So the breath is really critical for practice because it gives you something to kind of relax into. So you just kind of bow and then you relax and you come up. And the reason I find that to be really helpful is because it gets the body to relax. If you do yoga, you can see the bowing is like kind of a little bit like the child's pose. You know, you're kind of completely on the floor and it's like the most weak pose you can be in in the sense that um, you're fully exposed. You're not holding on to anything. You're not trying to protect yourself in some way. The, the tricky piece about Chan is it's pretty strong. And so it's easy to get reinforce the identity if you're not doing it quite right. It's been my experience. You kind of get trapped in my own. So the bowing actually really helps let go kind of on a physical level and that moves into the mental and the emotional level. Um, so I think that's one piece of the bowing. The bowing also develops a certain amount of humility because usually when I'm really upset about something, let's say anger, there's usually because in my mind I think I'm right in some way and somebody else does something that's wrong in some way and then since they say something wrong to me that was right, then I'm really angry. <laughs> and so the process of bowing, what happens is actually you realize, you know what, I don't have to like be right. I can just let that go. And then the anger kind of goes, goes away. And that goes for many of the afflictions. That's, that's kind of, you'll start seeing the patterns of our own minds and then the, and then you can start letting them, letting them go. Um, recitation, I find it's very helpful for um, maintaining a mindfulness throughout the day. Somebody talked about practicing as a busy professional. Recitation is really helpful. So if you can kind of build it into your daily life, like what you're doing, like say you're washing the dishes or just walking up and down the hill, you know, last year I remember we actually walked up and down the hill reciting. But you can actually walk with your footsteps. Namo Guan Shi Ying Fu Sa or Namo Amitofo or whatever you like to recite. You can even say, uh, may all be peaceful, may all be well, or may I be happy. You know, whatever you would like to say and you just make that your kind of recitation. What it does is it keeps your mind at a certain level of stability and not letting our mind just wander. Because I think you probably learned that the mind, when it's just left to wander, gets itself into trouble <laughs> pretty quick, you know? That's the other thing that's, that's good about being in this kind of environment is that we actually have a very structured day. So your mind can't wander too much. It can wander for maybe about like two hours. And this period of time, you can wander, wander, but then all of a sudden you're brought back into some kind of ceremony or some kind of lunch or some kind of Dharma talk. So you can't wander too much. If you're at home, you know, if like eight hours of unstructured time, then your mind can just start wandering, you get worried about something, and then it's, <laughs> it's completely gone, right? And so the recitation keeps you grounded. And you can, the thing that's nice about recitation, you can do it every, anywhere you're going. If you have beads, you can use your beads. I, I, somebody actually taught me how to do the beads. And essentially, it's actually very simple, but they explained to me, it's every, every bead, you, you, you basically recite one, one name, if you want to, or one mantra. And what happens, I find, with the with a kind of finger is that the physical gesture triggers the mental movement, if that makes sense. You know, it's kind of the, the, the external f movement of something kind of helps remind an internal memory, uh, internal thing that happens. So, so that's, I find that to be pretty helpful. If you're, you know, if you're in class, the teacher's kind of boring. So rather than complaining in your mind, this is really boring. This is like the ultimate antidote for boredom. Because <laughs> you, you can actually catch yourself from getting bored. Because you start going, oh, I'm getting bored. You go, wait a minute, I can recite. Why would I want to waste my consciousness per being, being bored? I mean, I don't want to waste my consciousness being bored. I can actually use it for... And actually, the Buddhism says our mind is so powerful. If we can actually use our mind skillfully moment to moment, uh, the tr ability to transform ourselves and the people around us is, is tremendous. We just don't, don't know how much power we have. 
So each thought is actually really, really important. So not to waste it, to really cherish it. So each, each moment of my existence is really precious. So even wherever I am, I've always got my mind. You know, so I actually have so many meetings in the monastery. You'll be surprised how, how many meetings there are in monasteries. We have lots of people living together trying to make decisions. <laughs> Jing Rocher knows. <laughs> and so I just bring my bees. Also, these meetings are pretty oftentimes chaotic. Uh, I think Jing Rocher probably could know. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, what's going on? And so I make sure I have my bees. I go, it keeps me from getting afflicted. You know, I just recite. <laughs> You're listening. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening, but you know, I'm just kind of okay. But I'm not trying to get my mind to be afflicted because my mind can go like, what are we doing? Are we even like, on topic? Like this makes absolutely no sense. You know, so I just can recite. I have learned a lot of meeting skills from living in the monastery, <laughs> just out of basic survival need. So. Uh. And as you get older, it gets worse. It's more for meetings? Oh my God, your mind gets mm. worse. I mean, you plan everybody's life. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get upset because it doesn't happen. <laughs> you said it well. You said and it then well. you have grandchildren and they're not listening. And oh my gosh, you already went through your kids and now you have grandchildren. And, oh my gosh. And it's like, please give me some peace. <laughs> In Catholicism, you have uh, what? Is it the Mary? Isn't there a recitation? Holy Mary? Rosary, yeah. Same. Right? Same. And sometimes it doesn't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> your brain and your mind is like, oh. <laughs> yeah, so you got to work out your own, 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 own styles. My experience is bowing and breathing is often a first place to start. You want your body to be completely relaxed. Because if your mind is not really relaxed and your body is not really relaxed, then as you recite or you meditate, it ends up just kind of, uh, sometimes it's kind of catching itself in a loop. You know, so that's, that's my sense of it. So before you go to meditation, you have to be relaxed? Yeah, so somebody asked about meditation. Yeah, I would definitely, I would say the first place to start from, which I wish I knew when I started, was meditation's concentration comes from relaxation. It's not f a concentration that comes from tightness. And that's when I first started meditating. I thought concent the concentration of Buddhism was like, I got to focus. You know, I was like, I remember like if I was going to take a test in college or in high school and I get a pencil out or a pen out and I start, I'd actually like shift my body sideways and then go, okay, I'm going to concentrate <laughs> and I'm going to work on it, you know, and I come out three hours later, really, really tense, but finished and okay, I'm done, <sighs> you know, but that's not, that's not how meditation's concentration works. It comes from a relaxed mind. Uh, actually in Buddhism, you're natural state is that of a stable, concentrated, firm, uh, unmoving mind. A kind of inner confidence that doesn't need to go out. A content inner confidence. And so the precept is just allowing us the opportunity to, to get back to that. You could say we call it about the self nature in the sutra, right? This zixing or the Buddha nature is that we have this inner uh, confidence and stability that we run away from, from all the, all the things that we do. And so to get back to it, it's a process of letting go. It's not about getting more stuff. That's why in the sutra, they say nothing to attain. In the Heart Sutra, there's nothing to attain. There's nothing to really get. It's just a process of letting go, relaxing. Let go, let go, let go, let go. And when we're able to let things go, our lives get better and better and freer and freer. Although we might not have as much stuff around us and the external markers of success, what you find is our hearts a lot more peaceful. If you look at the, the Six Patriarch Sutra, those people who are chasing after all the external markers of success are really stressed out, right? It's a pretty, pretty miserable existence. And society often tells us to run the wrong way, sad to say. So, so for meditation, that's, that's, so usually when I, if I were to talk about meditation, I say the first thing is I try to make sure the body is straight and good posture. And as you exhale, you relax the body. If some people have done a little bit of yoga, uh, there's a lot around inhale and exhale. And so I find that the breathing is a really helpful way to first stabilize and make sure the body is aligned and the body is relaxed. And then take that as much through your day as possible. So whenever I can check in, can my body straight and my body relaxed? And you'll find that you can't, really can't get that angry if you're relaxed. <laughs> you really can't get too upset if you're relaxed. So if you can just go check how am I physically doing, then 
there's a place where you can kind of ground yourself all the time. So your question is, how do you deal with sleepiness? Yeah, so this is interesting. So one place for practice that's actually pretty important is you're not actually trying to get comfortable. That's, that's a tricky thing because in the society, most of the time we're just trying to get comfortable, trying to get a little bit more comfortable bed, trying to get a little bit more comfortable maybe car, get a little bit more comfortable relationship, maybe a little comfortable whatever it is, just get a little bit more comfortable. Uh, but as you can tell, it's a kind of an endless process because every time we kind of get to a comfort, somehow that's not quite enough to so keep going for more and then go for more and go for more. Uh, the thing though, it doesn't actually lead to any particular liberation. And so in Buddhism, we actually have a kind of asceticism. But asceticism is not just so we can beat ourselves up, it's because it keeps us a little bit on an edge. And by that edge, we can actually grow. You know, there's a kind of a, an edge. So I don't know if you, have, if you have an edge for yourself that you can find. Like something you really want to do. <laughs> like when you're sitting or are you? I can actually, I can feel myself suddenly falling asleep and have to snap on and I kind of draw it. Like, wake, up. wake up. Do you have something that's really motivating to sit? Motivating to sit? Like why would you want to meditate? Oh, I, I like meditating. So comfortable. So comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> you got a little bit more. You got a little bit more than the, the comfort as an interest. I mean, that's a tricky phrase. If the comfort's the interest, then you just go comfort and you just go to sleep. You know, so you need like, you look like the sixth patriarch. It's like trying to end birth and death. You know, there's a kind of a, there's a kind of there was a really interesting story with um, Great Master Han Shan, Han Shan, Han Shan Dasher. Sure. He read in the sixth patriarch at one point. We haven't got to it yet, but um, I think. Reverend Hong Shui mentioned that the people were sent to kill him. So when they come and kill him, he was sitting, and he actually offered the person his head. He says, you know, you have my head. And the person tried to kill him, but wasn't able to do so. And so Great Master Han San saw, read this, and he said, okay, so from then on, when he meditated, his contemplation was somebody was going to come into the room and chop off his head, and that he would be in a state ready to give them his head. And that's how he practiced. <laughs> <laughs> we are not level yet. I know we're not that level, but what I mean is we actually have a little bit of fire under our... We have a little bit of a fire that drives us. Otherwise, if it's just comfort, then we'll fall asleep. And the tricky thing is that's easy for us to go into. So what's the, what's the fire that whoo, gives us some energy? Yeah? What if it's the opposite and you're thinking too much? You know, breathing. Breathing, um, thinking too much? Um, my experience is thinking too much is probably uh, breathing is probably the most effective. The Buddha actually recommended that that for thinking too much, a mindfulness of the breath is the best way to gather in your thoughts. Can you say the steps like you told me once? I don't know if I told you one. Yeah, there's people count. You can count one, two. Another. I actually found. As I said, I actually found bowing to be super effective when sitting doesn't work, is because bowing gets my whole body involved. Um, I don't know if people have a devotional side. I have a bit of a devotional side. So there's a sense like I really do have this kind of, um, you know, trust or kind of like, you know, I want to, uh, you know, walk this path with some kind of devotion and, and, and faith and confidence. And so that the bowing has an, I can see it activates other emotional aspects of myself that help counterbalance whatever state I'm in, if that makes sense. But I don't think that's essential. You know, different people have, have different things. I mean, you can imagine just bowing to your parents if you want, you know, or somebody you respect. Something that kind of brings, or even nature. I remember we had a really powerful, uh, uh, it was actually with Zilong. He got the monks to go with him on a, um, he had a, like a spiritual ecology, ecology hike. Yeah, yeah. And he got the monks to come from Mount Tamalpais. And then I found out that everybody in the hike had to create their own little spiritual exercise on the mountain. And I remember I realized that he brought us as his spiritual exercise. <laughs> so we, we actually did three steps, one bow when we got to a certain point in the mountain. But it was the first time I've ever bowed outside on like absolutely just like dirty ground. And it was really powerful. You know, I actually got a cut because there was a rock there and it cut my hand. Uh, it was nothing, nothing bad. But it was like, wow, when I was bowing down, it's like I could feel the earth. And it was like, and I, it was, we kind of framed it like you could just be bowing to the earth. 
And I think that's a very spiritual thing for many, at least the younger generation having grown up in America. We, have a, we do have a reverence for nature and the beauty of nature and know how much we've harmed it. And so, you know, bowing is a really good gesture of, of kind of repentance, of saying, you know, I'm sorry for all the things that I've done and all my fellow human beings have done to hurt you. And just that emotional sense counteracts a lot of the afflictions because those afflictions can't overpower that real sense of, of wanting to change for the better or help something good. Um, I think your mom might have been asking this at first, but just like when you mentioned like the first step when you meditate is like to keep yourself straight, your body straight and relaxed. Yeah. Like when you go into meditation, because I know that there are different ways you can meditate, like there's like compassion meditation or you can like try to focus on something like an object or perhaps just observe your thoughts. What is like, how do you normally go about it? Or what is, or is there a goal or is it not? Is it just like sitting there and observing? Um, what I experienced at our tradition is that we pretty much have this sense of whatever works. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever works. So there are some places you go and they give you this one method and you just use that method. Here it's kind of like whatever works to help you work through your afflictions, mm -hmm. that's really good. And so you look, you'll see in the Sixth Patriarch Sutra, his, the chapter on meditation is only like a page and a half. Well, this chapter on repentance is like, like nine or ten pages. And so in some sense, in the, when you really look at the tradition, it's about transforming ourselves from our deepest afflictions as openly and honestly as possible. So whatever works to help us do that is, is helpful. But if you can, like, so, uh, you know, just mention Just that. mention it. Yeah, so some of the techniques, I gave one with, this is, I didn't read it somewhere, but I found it helpful. It's actually just uh, breathing, as I said, kind of with your body straight and then kind of relaxing on the out breath. I kind of making sure I'm first, before I start doing the practice, I'm pretty relaxed. Because what I found is when I try to do the practice that I'm not relaxed, usually I'm not really doing the practice. I can kind of get myself into a, a state where I'm just trying to get through it as fast as possible. You know, oh, I, have my, I have my practice, I have to recite these things, so I've got to recite it. Okay, and I'm not actually coming from a place of, of a kind of a, a, a solidity, just kind of a rushed mind. Right? So that's, that's one piece. In terms of actual practice, I think it really depends. Um, I do a lot of great compassion mantra. I find that to be really helpful. It's, a, it's a kind of like a minute long, so you start doing it, it just kind of gives you a minute of mindfulness. As you start, you go like, you start it, and you kind of you get like a minute, you know. Uh, sometimes I recite with the in and out breath, Gwen and Bodhisattva's name. Uh, what, actually, one key place is you have to bring your energy down to your Dantian. That's really pivotal. That's very important. So they say your eyes to your nose, your nose to your mouth, and your mouth to your dantian, your heart, or your uh, uh, your dantian is two inches below your navel and two inches in. That's your dantian. And so you bring. If you do the shark exercise, it's like this, and you come all the way down here. And you go here actually. So if you can keep your energy and your attention down here, you'll find that generally you feel much more grounded throughout the day. And that's something you can just practice and you're sitting there. You can kind of uh, bring your energy down. That's one of the few meditation instructions I've seen Master Hua repeat over and over again. That's the... Yeah. Yen guan bi, bi guan ko. How do you bring the energy down? Okay, if you were just to sit straight, if you're just sit straight right now and just kind of sit straight with your feet on the ground, back straight. So you breathe in, right? And just imagine your eyes looking at your nose. Your nose looking at your mouth. And then your mouth and your attention going down to your stomach. Do you feel kind of a... Focus your, your, there's an attention that kind of goes down and kind of washes down. You can do it on your exhale if you like a little bit, but just kind of you just bring your energy down, down, down. And then you hold it for so long and just breathe back out. Um, you don't have to hold it because your attention just, just stays there, ideally. So your attention, your breathing just becomes natural and then you bring your, your attention just stays there. Okay. So your attention stay there while then you continue. To you continue to breathe. Just you breathe normally, and your attention stays there, and you just kind of keep your energy in your in your center of mass. 
It's actually a very important because it's actually, it's actually yogic. Now, we didn't move into the various things with gender and things, uh, but there's a lot of yogic pieces of Buddhist practice that transform the inner energetic systems. You know, Reverend Hong Shur mentioned the chakras mm -hmm. when we were citing the Guan Yin Bodhisattva's name. But, but in the process, it's actually changing our inner energies inside to kind of harmonize them. So this bringing our energy down helps stabilize our emotions, stabilize our inner, inner energies, so we're not so uh, frenetic. So the goal is to maintain it down. If you lose it, you stall over. Yeah, just, 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 just bring it out down and just bring it. So the meditation gives you a place to practice that. But throughout the day, you can do it as well. You just keep your energy, you know, generally in the same place. Yeah. I think you use the word Luan. Oftentimes, Luan, Luan. They have different, different Luan. Okay, so we have pretty much, I don't know if there's the last Okay, we'll see. There was something I didn't address today that people mentioned. I think that was the meditation. Okay. Well, we didn't get to the gender. Qu I don't know if people already answered that for people, but we can talk about that if people have questions about it tomorrow. Okay. So it's about three. If people have more questions, we can answer tomorrow. You can keep reading the sutra and see if you have any questions from that. Yeah. Okay. So see you all tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.